Rudy is going to take a deep dive into Drupal and also tell us uh, more about local, uh, Drupal distributions. Uh, before we do that, though, first a reminder that this uh, event is being recorded. So if you do not want to be filmed or photographed, please let us know. And uh, before we get started, Grace is going to tell us a few words about Silicon Brighton and Runway East who kindly support this meetup tonight. Over to you, Grace. Sounded like a, a, some sort of announcement um, alarm. Hello. Um, I think I've met most of you already, but hi to anyone I haven't. I'm, I'm Grace and I run Silicon Brighton alongside Steve, our co-founder, just sat at the front there. Um, first of all, massive thanks to Runway East. Um, they basically give up their venue um, for lots of different um, meetups and events uh, that are happening Um they give us the space for free. They give us an allowance towards the all-important pizza as well. Um, they're a fab co-working space and they have um, desks for individuals, but also for businesses as well, um, for office space of various sizes. So um, if you want to have a sneaky tour um, or if you want to um, just come and sort of give it a go for, for a day, um, then let us know. We can definitely introduce you to the team, um, get, give it a try out. But yeah, massive thanks for, for hosting us for free. Um, and then in terms of Silicon Brighton, uh, again, sorry for the repetition for any of you who know our spiel. Um, this is more for the online audience and for anyone who's new. But um, we are the hosts of Brighton and Host Tech Sector. Um, so this is one of about 30 tech and digital meetup groups that happen um, across the city. Um, they are all um, free. Um, to attend. They're all hybrid as well. Um, so whether you want to come in person or tune in online, um, they're available for people at all levels. Um, and the idea is to remove any barriers to entry at all for people that want to come to these events, meet new people, upskill, learn new things, um, all that good stuff that happens from getting together either online or in person. Um, and yeah, in terms of, of us, these are some of our values as well, um, which we like to sort of see across all the groups. Um, but we, uh, impact is really important to us. Um, we respond. Friendship is something um, that's really important. We take action and we want to amplify everyone's voice. Um, we've got our social channels just on there. Um, so we've got a really good offline in-person community, um, but we also um, gather online. Uh, across socials and then also on Slack as well. Um, so please follow us or uh, join us on Slack uh, and carry the conversation um, on over there. Uh, but more importantly, come to other meetups, tell your friends about it um, and get stuck in. These are all our fabulous supporters, um, businesses who contribute to us on a monthly basis, uh, basically to fund what we do so that these groups can continue to be free for everyone. Um, so just a massive thank you to all of those businesses. And I think that's it. So um, back over to Yannick, who's going to introduce us to our speaker tonight. Thank you, Grace. Uh, I think we've got a job announcement as well. Yeah, do you want to... Hi everyone. Uh, so this is very last minute, so I haven't got any slides or anything. Uh, I'm Mark. I'm a CTO of a new startup called Shop Through. Uh, literally just started this month, so I've only been there for a, a week and a half, but the business has only just been. So there is literally four of us at the moment. Uh, so Shop Through is a new SaaS product which aims to sort of tap into the affiliate marketing. Uh, side of things. So publishers, large publishers, small publishers, they use affiliate marketing to gain more revenue. So, you know, big advertisers, big publishers, like online newspapers, magazines, they actually earn about 25% of their revenue these days through uh, affiliate links, essentially. So I don't know if you've ever been on, you know, one of those sites, you click on a, you click on a link, essentially they earn a small commission from that. It's quite a simple model, but generally what happens is they lose a lot of that commission. Uh, they basically, you know, you click on that link, you then visit a voucher code, the voucher code site then gets the affiliation. Uh, it's, you know, difficult for the publisher because you jump off on to a different site, but also they don't know necessarily if you've, you know, followed on from there. So it's a weird tracking process. What Shop Through is trying to do uh, is essentially change how you shop on these, uh, through these affiliate links, by actually keeping you on those sites. So we load an in-context checkout, so you never actually leave. So say you're on, I don't know, which. Uh, site, for example, and you're viewing the best kettles 
and you click on one of the links, actually an in-context checkout will actually load up there and then connected directly to the retailer. So the retailer actually sees the, the order go straight into their system. On that, on that checkout, we allow sort of one pay clicks with your, you know, your smartphone if you're logged in, Apple Pay, Google Pay. Uh, and then we can you know, directly you know, attribute the commission uh, to the publisher. So as I said, we've just started. Uh, if you want to ask me any more questions about it, come speak to me at the end so I can give you more. But we are looking for developers. Our stack is primarily on PHP. There is some Python there and a, and a JavaScript uh, headless front end as well. As a, I'm not going to say the word microservices, but it is a service orientated architecture, <laughs> uh, probably with the aim you know, moving into that scope. So please, yeah, if you are interested in learning more about it, but if you are interested in also maybe coming to work for us, uh, come speak to me afterwards. I'd be happy to uh, tell you anything more. Thank you. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Andy, how are you doing? You all right? Thank you. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, to, first of all, thank you for doing this, uh, for speaking tonight. Um, I mean, uh, it really pleases me when people from uh, like the PHP Sussex community uh, kind of, uh, you know, step up and get behind the microphone as well. I think it's really cool. Uh, so, like I said earlier, so you work at uh, the uh, Brighton & Hove City Council, and you're going to tell us more about um, local go Drupal in a minute. But when you sent me the details of your talk, uh, it made me wonder about like the relationship between um, local councils and open source at large, essentially. So beyond local gov Drupal, uh, are there any other ways in which like the public sector and local councils uh, interact with open source? Like do you do you guys use other tools as well? And do you how do you share knowledge as well? Like do you um, is there like some sort of council tech meetup where you gather yeah, and so, exchange information or what's how does it work? Yeah, so there's uh, quite a few of those um that are sort of happening more and more, um, particularly in the public sector, gov sector as well. Um, so the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, um, they have a thing called the Local Digital Fund, um, which councils can apply to um, for funding for open projects. And as part of the, um, you have to sign up to the Local Digital Declaration, which pledges you to work in the open and to adopt more open source technologies. So um, local gov Drupal itself was birthed through that project. Um, and there are various rounds of funding that they do. So there's like an open planning portal that's the, being trialed. Um, there's one of the projects we work with is um, the um, open referral, which is a new directory standard. Um, and there's various others, so lots of councils We'll find a partner and build up collaborations that way. Um, yeah, no, that's that's really, really cool. Um, and so, all of those tools uh, can can the general the general public contribute? Like, can I go to can I go to a GitHub repository tomorrow and open a pull request, or is that not really a thing? Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, so for local gov. I can't speak for the other projects, but for local gov Drupal specifically, um, we are hosted on GitHub, so we have had. Um, others that are not associated with a council or a, a developer still come in and submit an issue. Um, they've like downloaded the code and started trialing it and discovered a problem and have actually submitted patches and right. that's gone through the review process and we've accepted them. Um, it's not as usual because it's typically a project you would work on sure. if you were um, associated with the project, but yeah. we do continually work upstream so frequently if I'm fixing something or if one of the team is fixing something, we will post that on Drupal.org. And if we have a patch, we'll post a patch or we're reviewing stuff as well. So there's always two-way interaction between that and the wider community. Oh, that's, uh, that's really, really cool. So, okay, so I, I find it really cool that people from the outside can uh, also contribute. Like, yeah. I, I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I think it's cool <laughs> that you can. Um, so, I mean, in general, I think it's very interesting to explore like the relationship between uh, I guess the public sector and open source um, also because I mean open source is kind of like inherently transparent right and uh -huh. kind of want to say democratic in a way as well so I guess it makes sense that the public sector uh -huh. would like use that as well um, anyway I know you're gonna 
probably going to tell us a bit more about that in a minute anyway. So I'm going to let you get on with your talk now. So yeah, without any further ado, please welcome Andy for the talk, uh, Demystifying Drupal and Drupal Distributions with Local Go Drupal. Thank you. Okay, okay so uh, I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction. Um, uh, as Colin there, uh, Andy Broomfield, I'm working as a senior web developer at Brighton Hove City Council. So I started there in 2019, just before the uh, pandemic. Um, that was mostly helping with maintaining their newly launched Drupal 8 site and then um, the move towards the local Gov Drupal distribution. As part of that, I became a co-maintainer. Um, I co-maintained the alert banner module as well as the general fixes for some of the wider distribution. Um, I've been doing Drupal since 2009. Um, started out in Drupal 6, mostly also along with other various PHP languages. So I've worked with Codeigniter and um, lots of WordPress and OpenCart and various other stuff, but Drupal has kind of been my mainstay. Um, I'm not so active on socials, but if you are on the um, Mastodon Fediverse, then I have an account on phpc.social, so that's where you can find me. Um, and I'm going to go through with what we're covering today. So we're just going to have a look at what Drupal is. Um, so kind of as a tech meetup, meet sometimes you don't really uh, get a sense of what um, some of the wider products are. So this is going to have a look at how Drupal itself is put together. Um, and then we're going to have a look at um, what we mean by the concept of a Drupal distribution. Um, so it's how Drupal gets customized into something that can then be uh, released um, and, and built upon. And then we're going to look at the distribution I work on, which is called Local Gov Drupal. So as I mentioned with uh, Yannick, it was um, initially funded through the Local Digital Fund, um, and it's a code developed by 40 plus local authorities in the UK and Ireland, and as well as various um, agency suppliers that work with us. Um, so Drupal, what is it? It's um, the way most people come across it is that it's a content management system. It's a way of you put uh, you've got blog posts, news articles. You want to get them on a website. Um, I've seen it used from very small personal blogs, little small web shops, right through to very large enterprise businesses. Um, so some of the major sites on the country run it. It's, um, I found these statistics, which is that 1.7 million websites run on Drupal, and it's quoted as saying that's 12.8% of the top 10,000 websites. Um, within local government, um, 85 sites from local authorities are running a version of Drupal. Um, there are currently 39 on the local Gov Drupal distribution. Um, that includes Brighton and Hove and Croydon Council, which are the initial two. And then it expanded to um, more councils as they've discovered local Gov Drupal as a distribution and have built those with their web teams um, or their agencies. Um, it's open source, so it is GPL2. Um, so you can download it, you can start customizing it. Anything we've done in local Gov Drupal that's also GPL2. So the only condition really is, is that if you're then releasing that, it's free to share because no one likes vendor lock-in. Um, and there's this thing that's like, like 1.39 million members of the Drupal community um, and 124,000 contributors, 50,000 plus contributed modules. I think that's some statistics from Drupal.org. So looking at people who signed up with them the uh, Drupal.org uh, account. Um, it has a song. I won't play it that long because it does get annoying, but... Um... Yeah, I won't play it too long. Um, there is a, 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, that is on YouTube. There's a link there. There's also a Swedish death metal version if you're able <laughs> to listen to it. Um, so history of Drupal. Uh, Dries started it in 2001. Um, that's a quote from when he started it. It started out as a message board, very similar to Slashdot. If you've ever used Drupal and seen some of the really unusual features, like how it does a big feed um, of all your content by default, um, how it's sort of, oops, a bit of feedback? Yeah, um, how it kind of has the user profiles and community features sort of from the get-go, It's that's from its history that it is this um, community billboard system. Um, Around 2006, 2007, that was when it kind of got some mainstream breakthroughs. So the MTV site, the NASA website started being developed in Drupal. It was around that time that you had the Barack Obama White House using Drupal for 2008. Um, and then Drupal 7 came along in 2011, and that's kind of been the mainstay of a lot of the Drupal community. Um, that brought in a lot of the core features that were initially contrib modules, um, like the views module and um, adding fields, that actually came into core. And then Drupal 8, that came in 2015. Drupal 8 was built around Symfony, so it became a much more modern application, uh, a more modern PHP application, um, so it could be expanded upon and use more modern development methods. Um, although Drupal 7 is still around, um, which we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Drupal 9 and 10 have since followed in 2020 and 2022. They've recently adopted a new release model, which means Drupal 10 will be supported until 2026, um, effectively as an LTS release. So the way they're doing it now is, is that while Drupal 11 will come out in 2025, I think it is, there's still gonna be more of an overlap for you to upgrade. So you've got Drupal 10 until um, Drupal 12 is ready. Um, so Drupal 7, as I said, it's, it's a very procedural uh, system. So it's sort of, it, it's, it runs everything as one big code base. Your module files are largely hooks, um, but it did bring things like fields and the views module, which is the query builder, um, into the uh, main core. Um, it still has quite a large install base. I was trying to find some statistics and they were quoting me that something like a third of sites are still Drupal 7. Um, so there is a lot of particularly large sites, but also quite a lot of small blog sites and small community charity sites that are still running on Drupal 7. Um, that recently meant that the Drupal security team extended the end of life deadline to uh, January 2025. So there is still time to start looking at how, if you've got a site on Drupal 7, how you want to migrate that away and move to something like uh, either Drupal 10 or there is potential for um, extended support on Drupal 7. So some companies will offer to maintain it for a fee. There's also a fork of Drupal, of Drupal 7 called Backdrop, um, and Backdrop was started as part of the split between moving to Symfony, so it still has some features from Drupal 8, like the config manager, um, but essentially extends the Drupal 7 code base, and that's since gone on to be quite an active community around that project. Um, I've personally done one site on Backdrop, and found it to be a quite nice system to use for a much smaller site that perhaps doesn't need the extensive features that Drupal 8 has. Um, it has developed because of the, um, this is my friend Jenny who used to run the Brighton meetups. Um, as Drupal got extended, um, she coined the term, call it Drupal XP. So there's this module you can install on your Drupal 7 site and put XP and it will say, um, it'll call that as the version number for your Drupal 7 website. Um, so 8 plus, um, we're currently on Drupal 10. Um, that moved from a procedural base to object oriented PHP. Um, procedural code still exists, so we will do some demos on that, um, but 
you can use hooks, but a lot of it now is it's an object orientated code base. It's built on the Symphony framework. I believe it's currently on 6.4, which is the LTS version of Symphony. Um, so when you install Drupal, you will install the Symphony components alongside, alongside it. Um, they recently made it so that it wasn't locked to particular versions as tightly so that you can update some of the Symphony frameworks without necessarily updating Drupal core. And that was just to speed up um, bringing in some security updates. Um, this meant that uh, it's now thoroughly a composer-based workflow. So you require modules um, using the command line. So you'll either use composer create project or you'll use composer required to bring in a Drupal module or a Drupal theme. Um, some of this is being abstracted for site builders. So the contention around why backdrop moved away, at least in part, was that it became very more technical focused. And that's something that Dries has been trying to um, move back from and to say that actually, um, you know, site builders should be able to manage their sites without um, having to have very high technical knowledge. So there is a new thing coming in called the uh, project browser and automatic updates. And the way that will work is, is that behind the scenes, it will run Composer, but site builders won't necessarily need to have to do that. If you are developing, um, this is something unusual that you don't find in many Drupal projects. And you do use the Composer patches plugin, and you do use patches quite extensively if there's an issue you need to fix. The reason for this is, is that um, a lot of the fixes when they're posted on Drupal.org before they're released, are still in the form of patches and patch files because that's how it used to work on drupal.org before GitLab was opened up. Um, so on any Drupal project, um, and when I show you a composer.json, you will find that there's um, a lot of patches that are applied to that project. Um, and there's a new thing that uses, which is configuration synchronization. So when you make changes to your website, you will export it to your site's config directory and you commit that to version control. And that is how you push things onto your dev and production environments. Um, in the Drupal 7 day, you could do this by syncing databases, but that could always be awkward. So you'd use um, a module like features to try and extend that. Um, but again, it, it sort of becomes complex. So doing it with config synchronization makes things a lot simpler. Um, and yeah, this should hopefully be the last of the big box of text. Um, it's more than a CMS. So it is a very modifiable. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a content management framework rather than um, a, a true CMS. Um, or you can think of it as it's a tool for building a CMS. And that's when we come into distributions. So. Um, in a start of a standard install, it gives you a usable framework to work with, but to sell this to a client or an end customer or a service user, you typically have to do quite a bit of the work in um, building out how, what kind of modules you want to include, how you want the content types to work, how you want block placement to work. Um, so a lot of people think of it as it's, it's more like Lego, so modules will add building block functionality and distributions concentrate on adding feature sets. Um, and it's been said that Drupal, and this isn't Dries announced at DrupalCon, is he talked this about, um, it's for ambitious site builders. So people who not necessarily are fully into coding, but still have ideas that they want to create. Um, so this, plugs into the concept of low code and no code. Um, if you've ever come across those terms, um, that's kind of a way of um, building things in kind of a UI and then plugging it with an either just some very tiny script or not much script at all. Um, oh, there are a couple more things. So it does get kind of a bit heavy. Um, there's this thing called an entity in Drupal and not everything, but nearly everything is. Um, these are essentially the, the core way Drupal handles its data model. And 
these are essentially classes that then are also connected to a database or a config file. Um, you have the configuration entities that you export. So when you create a content type or a media uh, or a thing called paragraphs, which is how you do page components, um, they will get exported. And then your users, your end users, they will use content editing entities um, to create content. It still uses the term node, and that, again, dates back to some of the history of where Drupal came from. Um, but in the UI, it tends to be referred to as content. Um, and there's a thing called views, which I'll show you in a moment, which is um, that's kind of a query builder that lets you build those queries in the UI. So um, if you wanted to like put a list of things together, have some filters, you can do that entirely in the UI and it um, puts it together. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the little example site that I put together. Um, so I've just done a very basic install of Drupal out the box. Um, I'm going to, we have some content here, which is some blog post content, but we currently don't have a listing for them. So um, what we're going to do, we're first gonna go to structure. We're gonna go to views. I'm gonna add a view. My view is going to be called blog. And it's a content of blog post. Newest first. Create a page. Blog path of teasers. Display 10 items. Save and edit. And that has created this little view. Um, and we could just save that now. And go to that path. Okay, so if I went to, now I have my blog page and it's just done that without having to write any code. But one thing we might wanna do is put that into the menu. So normal menu entry. And I want to put it in main navigation, apply. Save. And there we go, it's in our menu. So, um, so that's what we mean by being able to do things without having to write code. Um, other things we could do here is, is that we could decide we wanted an image. So I'm gonna go into my content types uh, and blog post manage fields. Um, and this is actually a new UI they've done for Drupal 10.2. Um, and I would pick, actually I'll call it main image. And I'm gonna pick media, continue. And it's just one of those. And I'll be able to pick an image, save. And then I need to go into manage form. So as you're putting your CMS together for users, I'm just going to drag it so the image is the second field. And then in my display, I'm going to put the image at the top. I'm going to hide it. Rendered entity means, um, again, this is the thing about everything being an entity, means that um, pretty much a lot of the fields you'll be working with are entity reference fields. So we're referencing the media entity, which in turn references the file. Uh, so if I save that, if I go to content, edit that post, add media, and I've got a pre-selected image, and I will click save on that. And if I go back to my home, my blog, and we have to go in. That image is now added to the page. Um, and if I wanted that image to appear in that blog post, I could do that from structure, uh, content types. And because the view runs teasers, um, you have display modes. And by default, you've got a default, which is whenever there's nothing else selected, and a teaser. 
you can have a separate one for full content, but you can also create arbitrary display modes. But in our case, I'm just going to put the main image and we'll just do rendered entity uh, and we'll leave it at default. Um, if we had time, I could go into the more common settings. So you would create a, um, a different media size for um, those images. Um, but now that's now appearing in our little blog. Um, so yeah, that's an example of the things you can do in Drupal, even with just the stock install without writing any code. Um, and that's something that users and site builders can do um, out the box. Uh, okay, let's continue on. Um, so all about configuration. So you've built your site, but you want to get it onto a live site. Um, you probably don't want to be doing the thing of exporting your entire database and flashing that up onto your production server. Um, what you want to do is synchronize your site development from staging to production from your local development. Um, you can do that in a couple of ways, actually. You can do it um, in the UI. So there is an export function that lets you um, export config as a zip file. And what it will do is it will contain a set of YAML files, which is just, this is your site's configuration. This is how all those entities that we just built. This is how the view is. And then you can import that into a Drupal site and it will install that site. Um, you also have a thing called Drush, uh, which we'll go into a moment, which um, that lets you do it on the command line. So that's often how we prefer to do it in development. And also it means it's scriptable. Um, and what we can then do is we can commit that config to version control. So it goes into Git. Um, or Mercurial, which, whichever um, version control system you use. Um, and then that can be pushed up to your production server or your staging server. And so you can treat it as if you're changing code. It can be reviewed like standard pull requests. Um, there's a couple of gotchas you need to sort of be aware of with this. Um, that is particularly if you have config that is needs to be separate from a production server and a staging server. Um, so you've got a couple of options. Um, config split is the most popular way of doing this, whereas in the UI, there's the ability to say, I would like um, this bit of configuration only to be imported when we're on a production server, this bit on a development server, and that you can enable that in your settings file. So that's, a, that's effectively like an environment file that you can put in that will enable the relevant split. There's also config ignore, which is essentially a module that lets you say, um, do not export or import this config. Um, and that means you can change some settings in the UI and not have to worry about it. That's particularly useful when you want to protect things like API keys, because um, obviously you don't want to have those going on to a production server. Um, I mean, I can give you a little brief of configuration um, as we've built it in here under development. It is in configuration synchronization. Um, there's no stage config. So if I did export, it would download the entire config or I can do a, uh, well, let's do a content type. Blog post. And so it's a bit of YAML. So in the UI, I could paste that, um, or I could use Drush, and it would create some config in a config sync directory. Um, although in this instance, it'll it'll say it's the same, so I can't really show that. But on some of the local Gov Drupal sites, I'll I'll show an example of when you have different config and how to import it. Um, okay. Where are we? Uh, so there's also a command line. Um, Drush is something that has existed since some of the early days of Drupal. Um, the modern version is based on Symfony console. You do typically have to install it separately. So um, it's required that Drush is installed per project. Um, most, but not all distributions will include it. So Drupal by default doesn't include it. Um, 
with local gov Drupal and several others, it, it does get downloaded. So um, it's there and present, but if not, it's a composer require drush drush, and then it's installed into the bin directory. Um, essentially most things, if you can do it in the UI, um, they will have drush equivalents. You just can run drush, the drush command on its own will give you a list of all the drush things it can run. Um, the most typical one is operations, again, involving your config operation. So if I wanted to export my config to the config sync directory, I would just use drush um, config export or the shortcut CEX, uh, and then you can do the same for import. There is a drush deploy command, um, which is just a shortcut for run database updates and then import config and then clear all caches. Um, so typically in a build process, you will either run drush deploy or you'll run the separate scripts. Um, it also has some fun generators for custom code. Um, and we're in the age of AI and that, so it's sort of less relevant, but if you do need to scaffold things like a custom module, you can use drush generate module, and then that will go ahead and uh, generate the custom code required. Um, so that's a useful tool for most Drupal projects that you need to run into. Um, okay, extending it with uh, modules. So while the stock Drupal is kind of useful on its own, there is sometimes a need to um, extend this um, with either custom modules or modules that will give you extra functionality. Um, so these are things like having redirects, um, doing the search API, putting extra meta tags onto your site. Um, distributions will often come with a lot of these modules themselves. Um, but if you need to find something, um, a good stop is to look at Drupal.org. That has a collection of um, hundreds and thousands of modules to expand, extend your site functionality. Um, you install them through Composer. So they have a type, which is Drupal module. Um, and this is how Drupal knows to install it in the right directory. So um, they don't go in vendor as most dependencies they will go in the modules contrib folder um, of your site um, or custom if it's your own modules. Um, but Composer will know how to do this because it's defined as type and part of the Composer script that you get with either Drupal core or um, other modules comes with the relevant scripts for, comes with the relevant definitions so it knows to install it in the correct place. Um, you would use the module name info YAML for description and compatibility. Um, so this is just things like um, its version number uh, and what core it's compatible. Um, so previously, uh, Drupal modules were only compatible with a single version of core. So you had the Drupal 6 version for 6, the 7 version for 7. Um, late in the eight release cycle, they changed this to let you have a core version requirement and that allows you compatibility between different cores. So you can have a module that's compatible with nine and a module that's compatible with 10. Um, that's been very useful in the local gov Drupal project because it meant that when we went to Drupal 10, we didn't have to do a full release for all of our modules if, it, if we were using code that was um, already compatible with the next version. We could just say, this is compatible with the next version of Drupal. Um, and that helps with those kind of updates. Um, you still get procedural code. So dot module is historic. Um, that's something that has existed from the early days of Drupal. And that's where hooks come in. Um, but you also get the source directory. And that's where you'll add some um, um the more object orientated code. Um, modules can also install config themselves. So um, this is particularly useful in distribution world where you want to configure a site a certain way. Um, you could create a module that has the blog content type that we demonstrated and that would, when that's installed, it would actually install that content type into the website. Um, and that's used particularly extensively in local gov Drupal where um, some of our modules actually define 
the content types that we uh, rely on. Um, so hooks and procedural code, they will live in the module file. You can also, we'll sometimes see ink files, which again is another legacy of how Drupal was in the procedural days where you would load up all the um, these extra PHP files, but essentially what they are are just um, procedural PHP. Um, and it's usually to respond from hooks that are sent from other modules. So either Drupal core or the other module will send a call to say, execute any module that defines this hook. And that's in the form of your module name and the hook. Uh, the example here is uh, from a module called the Picard module. Um, if that was installed on your website, um, all the form buttons on your website would read, make it so. Um, so that's an example of a procedural thing. And it just, because it's procedural, it, it's available globally. Um, there's also other kind of hooks, which is pre-processed, and that's useful for modifying a variable that's sent to a template. Um, often this is the case when I'm writing some theme work, I'll need to um, have something extra available, like a little flag to say, um, is this promoted or is this one um, kind of a special one that I need to flag a highlight to? So at that point, I would um, use a pre-process hook instead and those are sort of named after the template that they're going to alter. Um, but you can do a lot more with Drupal 8 now. You can do some object orientated code. Um, so one of the most basic ones might be a controller. So rather than relying on um, the Drupal system, you can define controllers so that you still get the benefit of the menus and the theming of Drupal, but then everything that's rendered in the content area can be determined by your controller. And we've seen this with um, some parts of um, the sites where uh, we've had to, where we want to um, query some specialized services. So rather than trying to run this entirely in Drupal, we will just run this as um, a custom service and then return it through a controller um, so you define it in your routing YAML file, file. And the example on screen is, is, is from the service status landing list. So you define a path and the little thing in braces is um, placeholders. They come from the uh, symphony request object. Um, and you can define the default. So the title and the controller uh, refer to the classes and the method that you're going to execute. Um, and that's what returns a build. And build is, um, it's essentially a render array. So uh, with a lot of the Drupal um, controllers, you return this array with some settings for particular um, things you're going to output. And in this case, it's, it's, it's saying actually, here's a kind of theme where I want to render it and items is it's gonna call an, another service to get items based on the particular node, which would be um, a service landing page in this case. Um, there's also the requirements section that just says, so um, have you got the permission to access viewing nodes? And um, there's some custom access controllers. So you can actually pass another method and another class and a method and say, this is how I determine if access is permitted. Um, you've also got access to services. Um, so particularly uh, symphony style services and event subscribers. So these can be just arbitrary classes and then they get added to the symphony container. Um, and then you can call them using either a Drupal call to load a service or you can have the service injected into other classes as well. Um, so the description on the left just shows you how a uh, service definition is done and it's very similar to what you might find in just Symfony. So you define your service name and you say what classes and the argument is the other services in the container that you want to pass. So things like entity type manager and entity repository, they're actually um, Drupal services that Drupal has defined and 
they will get injected into your service through dependency injection. So you can use standard dependency injection patterns. Um, there's other things you can actually do by defining it as a service, which is you can actually run decorators. So if you actually want to override an existing service, you can define a decorator. And then when other things call a service by that name, if you're decorating it, your service class gets called in, in its place. Um, and there are certain priorities. The, the one thing that I find quite useful is this thing called event subscribers. So event subscribers, you will, um, one of the more common ones we have in local Gov Drupal is we have a custom page header event where we have the title and we sometimes wanna put a little summary, but sometimes we wanna change that. So when our search result pages, we want to inject what the uh, search term was. Um, or in this case, we might wanna um, remove or hide the block um, in this case for the service status view. Um, so we can actually just respond to the event and set the visibility there as false, or I could set the contents of the header to a different value, um, which is something we've done in many places. So that's kind of a, a useful tool to uh, and respond in a bit more modern way than some of the hooks. Um, and there's this thing called plugins, which are sort of different to modules. They, they, they exist as part of a module, but they come in a prescribed directory. So you don't define them in your services.yaml. Um, a common one is blocks. So I would put a block. Um, these are blocks are sort of things you might see in like the sidebar or on the footer that they, they might like have little banner images or a list of other articles. Um, and the way you define them, they go in the plugin folder and then in the block folder. And then you use a uh, doctrine, which is what that's up on the, on the right is. So it would be, you define it as, as an ID and an admin label. And the thing called context definitions is similar to the arguments that were being ejected in. Um, yeah, I can I can get a, I don't know if I can zoom that in. I don't think so. I can get some of these up on screen when we have a look through in a bit. Um, but yeah, so that uses a format of doctrine. There's also um, a new thing that PHP introduced, which was attributes. And so some plugins are going to start switching to using attributes in the future. Um, and there's another thing, which is themes. Um, theming, again, like modules, you install them in Composer. Um, they're a type called Drupal theme. So again, it just knows to put it in the right directory. Um, so you just can use Composer required Drupal theme name. The templating system is Twig. So again, it's taken that from the Symfony project. Um, and so Twig, you have variables that are injected to your theme and you just use the curly braces to sort of get them. It also means that it's a lot safer. So previously Drupal 7 would use PHP template. So that would be excusing PHP. Um, you probably don't necessarily want that on theme layers. So you can still do logic without necessarily exposing uh, PHP, PHP functionality. But if you still need it, there is the .theme file, which is, again, just a standard PHP file that can respond to hooks. Um, and it also has a thing called libraries.yaml, and that's just kind of how you would define your CSS. So typically, you might have general CSS that you want to load. But uh, one of the things, particularly Drupal 10, uh, well, Drupal 8, since Drupal 8 is allowed, is you can not load all the styles or all the JavaScript you want. Um, unless you actually require that on a page. So you would break it up into libraries and then through those libraries, um, you can define when you want to load those libraries. Um, so that's an example of a Twig uh, file. Um, so again, it's, it's largely HTML. That bit at the top is just a block of Twig that's saying um, what classes do you want to set? Um, so that is sort of adding those as a class array to that article um, tag. Um, 
and then you've got some if statements in there. But again, it's just a way of doing um, dynamic functionality without necessarily exposing PHP into a template. Um, and that's taken from the local gov base theme. So this is going to move on then to a concept, which is a distribution. So as I showed in that example, when I built that blog site, um, Drupal out the box, while it does have lots of functionality, it's, um, there's still quite a few things that are missing. So it doesn't include meta tags or redirects by default. Those are things that, uh, those are modules that you can install. Um, so a distribution essentially selects modules and themes that it wants to configure to use for a particular application. Um, these can be profile only. So particularly in, in very Drupal 7 world, the modules would actually ship with the profile and you'd only be able to update them when the profile was updated. But with Drupal 8, it's actually most distributions are now a composer template. So there's the main Drupal project, which you would use Composer to create project. But for all distributions, they will typically have their own Composer create project. And you would use that to um, download not just the install file and the Drupal core, but it would also say in its Composer JSON, these are the modules that I wish to install. And, um, and then it will have configuration that it wants to enable as well. Um, so modules can also be provided independently. So we do that with the local gov Drupal project. Um, not all of our modules are, um, they're included in the, in the distribution itself, but they're available independently. So if you were building a site and just wanted one module from that project, you could just install that independently and um, go and configure it to how, how you wished. Um, so an example of that be the alert banners that we do at the top of the pages, that's actually released as, a, as an independent module. Um, some can be a very specific feature set or more in general. So example distributions, you have Thunder, which is a web publishing. So if you wanted to build magazines, um, and there's some example, kind of the sites that have uh, been put in place. It still is very like Drupal, but it enables a lot of the nice themes and the media library and a lot of the things you would need for running an online publication. Um, so all your media text and all the things you would need to run a kind of a media rich site rather than um, some, some very stock. Uh, and that's from thunder.org. Um, if you've done a lot of e-commerce work, there is a project called Commerce. Um, again, it's kind of very popular in the Drupal 7 days, and that's now available as a uh, distribution called Commerce Kickstart, or sometimes just referred to as Kickstart. Um, and that offers you a ready-made web shop. So um, like many of these projects, you can actually install a demo module as well and it will give you some sample functionality. So if you wanted to try it out, so in that one, it, that Belgrade store is actually one of the demo modules that it comes with. And it then also gives you an out the box um, management for uh, infantry and sales. Um, farm OS, if you ever needed to manage a farm, um, that will pre-configure Drupal to uh, manage assets, manage land, animals, and it uh, gives you this geo thing so you can define what kind of uh, land ownership you want and divide your fields up. Um, open social, run a social network. Um, so again, this one is very, um, it's very rigid because a lot of its modules are actually part of open social. So it's a little bit tricky to customize, but you can still do it. So. Um, this is the thing, if you wanted to run a kind of private social network, um, it also has uh, some plugins. Well, I did some development for a plugin to um, power it with ActivityPub. Um, so that's the thing, you can connect that to the Fediverse as well. Um, it's not formally part of open social, um, but it's something that you can connect up if you wanted to um, have something wider. So. And ActivityPub has been something in 
um, WordPress world a lot. Um, so it's nice to try and connect those things together. And finally, the one that I'm going to talk about is um, a distribution called Local Gov Drupal. And this is for running council websites, local authority websites. Um, and this comes with a set of standard content types um, and a standardized base theme, which you can then customize. So it sort of sits between the um, not so opinionated, but gives you enough functionality like Thunder and some of the more very strict ones like uh, Open Social. It's still quite open for you to um, exchange and, and actually uh, to actually work with. Um, but it gives you quite a lot out of the box so that you will get a mix of uses from some councils essentially customizing the base theme and others actually wanting to run with it and do largely their own thing. There's a couple of other Gov distributions as well. Um, the, there's Gov CMS, which was funded by the Australian government um, and Gov.de, which is a German government one. So. Um, local Gov Drupal has tended to have a focus UK and Ireland. It takes its inspiration from a lot of the GDS um, model, but this kind of model is sort of happening around the world. Um, so it's kind of an interesting part from that. Um, so to give an understanding of what local Gov Drupal is, um, it's a collaboration between 40, what is now 40 councils in UK and Ireland and their supplier agencies. Um, I say that so that Brighton, we have an in-house team. Um, not all councils have in-house teams, so there will be agency suppliers that do need to get involved. Um, it offers you the ability to have a council website in a box, um, and you can then customize that with ongoing features. It's a cooperative model. Um, that means that um, anyone involved in the member councils can sort of turn up discussions about how that's developed. So it's not um, it's not just working with an end supplier. It's there's this sort of discussions with the digital team and with the stakeholders about how you want this project to develop and what kind of feature sets that you need to uh, need working on. Um, it's GPL2 license like Drupal. So um, when you extend Drupal, you tend to follow the same license. And it was funded initially by um, the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities. So part of that conversation we had with Yannick earlier, um, it was funded through the local digital fund initially. Um, and now it's funded by um, subscriber fees from councils and suppliers and some sponsorship as well. Um, so we're sponsored by NetCall which is another low-code platform for application building, um, as well as uh, voluntary from councils and there's a supplier membership. So that gives you benefits like um, being listed for um, council agencies, for councils who um, need someone to help build their site. Um, so just to go over some of the history, um, 2018 was when Brighton & Hove did a Drupal 8 website. Um, and then uh, when it came to 2019, Croydon Council, um, some of the dev team that were at Brighton moved to Croydon and they were saying, is there a way we could reuse some of this code? Um, and that was about the same time I actually joined Brighton. Um, and so we set up a set of GitHub repos for us to share module code. So they got a copy of the code we had worked on and we got a couple of modules that Croydon had developed um, and we were able to use those in our website. Um, so that includes some of the step-by-step -step functionality and some of the fixes that were done for the campaigns functionality um, on our site. So um, it kind of was kind of useful in that regard um, that you had developers and two authorities sharing code and being able to work together and that extended into the local digital funded project for a discovery phase. So a discovery phase is kind of working out problem space and um, uh, what kind of the different councils would get from a benefit from sharing code. 
um, and where would we go with this? And through that, we started putting the ideas around creating a distribution, which would be a ready installed version of Drupal that local authorities could take away. And that's where we had the alpha and beta phases. So that's kind of a, it comes from kind of GDS world where they have specific um, set of sprints. So discovery is a very quick sprint and then in alpha, you're sort of testing a few ideas. So that gave us an initial release. Um, the first council site that launched on local gov Drupal proper was Lambeth in, I think, 2020. Um, and that was done with Agile Collective, who've been uh, one of the tech partners that works with um, local gov Drupal from the beginning. Um, and then since then, it's expanded to many other councils. Um, there was a Drupal 9 version that followed in 2021. Um, Brighton and Croydon also brought their sites from the legacy code onto using local gov Drupal as a distribution, which meant that we got the benefit of the continued bug fixes that was being developed through the project. Um, and then it's expanded to 40 plus councils currently in the UK and Ireland. There's a network of suppliers that um, work with local authorities and it also has a community network as well so that if you're um, so not just the developers but also the non-technical the, the um, product owners and the various other stakeholders can get together and help work on what features and that should be prioritized um, and that brought in things like the new base theme and the microsites project so the microsites is a distribution in itself which allows you to spin up, say you had like a museum site or an event that was happening and that would let you readily spin up a Drupal website. Um, yeah, I'm gonna actually show you some of the demo. So this command on screen is, um, that just tells you how to create the, um, to get hold of the local gov Drupal code base. So we can use local gov three, which corresponds to a Drupal 10 install um, and that's just a compare to create project. Um, and then once we've done the site, well, I've, I've done a pre-install already. Um, we install a module called local gov demo. Local gov demo um, just installs a set of default content. So you've got something to work with and have a look at. Um, it's also using Lando, um, which is kind of a Docker container. So the project, we tend to use Lando. Um, you can use DDEV. I think very recently some default DDEV settings were added. Um, if so, if that's sort of more your preference, um, it also works fine as a standard MAMP or uh, MAMP stack uh, or any LAMP stacks. Um, so I've also used it kind of that way. Uh, I am going to quickly show what it looks like. So uh, this is when you first install it. Um, I'm actually logged in as the admin user as well. Um, and this is the default theme. Um, so it's based on local gov base, which gives you a template for all the, um, all the different content types. These little banners will appear around the site. They just announce what different things are. Uh, this is the alert banner and I can optionally hide it. And if I refresh, once I've hidden it, it won't come back unless I um, go and update it again. Um, so this just gives you a brief tour of the different sections. So this would be a typical homepage. Um, it's actually built on a concept called subsites, which we'll show in a moment. Um, you can build your own kind of layouts. Um, the core of a website of a local gov Drupal site is going to be your services. So these are the different services that citizens would need to render. Um, this is a landing page content type. So you've got action buttons at the top that would take you to uh, different sections. And you've also got um, these little pages that will take you to, uh, that's a, I'm correcting a, uh, this will give you examples of uh, service page content that has been drafted from uh, various different sites. Um, the Scarfolk Registry Office. I do think that there is this uh, in joke about referencing Scarfolk Council. <laughs> so that does come up quite a few times. Um, 
And with this, this content type is constructed for its users um, through the back end here. They can put in a description of it. They can, their top tasks are what those action buttons are. So I can put in a and I can define it as an action or information. And if I save that, that will appear on the top. Um, I'm actually, I'm conscious we're actually at eight o'clock, so I will try and skip through some of these. We can also do the child pages. And this section at the top is something that was added into the distribution. So any page that's linking, you can actually drag that and it automatically will add that to the child pages. Uh, the bit at the bottom is the service status. So that is just informing you that the registry office might be closed. Um, and you can also have a listing of all those statuses as well. There's also that page that was the controller example is that one. So you can get these uh, dashboard of which services are currently running and which ones are having difficulty. Um, there's also the directories project. And typically you'll see this with um, when an agency might approach a council, um, they might construct their directory separately to the main website. Um, the reason this is there is a obligation you have to create the local offer, which is a um, special needs directory. So that tends to be a first approach. This one is a directory of all the collaborators um, and you have facets which are searchable. Um, one of the big things we did is that these facets are actually user entered. So those building the directory, they can decide what facets they want to add. Um, so it's not something that has to be defined in the back end um, and they will uh, then be accessible for clicking on the front end. Um, it uses a module called facets behind the scenes and then it uses search API. There's various back ends for it, but um, the example uses the database, but you can also use solar. Um, in Drupal world, solar tends to be more common than um, the other one, Elasticsearch. Um, though I think there is an Elasticsearch uh, search API backend, and so you can also have it run through that. Um, the directories themselves, again, this would be user editable. Um, one thing that came from the project that has recently been promoted to, it's not one of these ones, so I'm just gonna go up to here. Uh, directory channel, uh, directory venue filter, uh, I'll go into here, is we have a uh, entity known as GeoEntity, which started off as the local gov geo project and has recently been promoted onto Drupal.org as its own module. And this, like you have media, which is reusable media, um, we have the opportunity to do reusable geography. So if you have many places that are in the same place, um, you can, uh, I will delete that one temporarily. You can select a location and you can either browse or search for it, or you can create a new address here. Um, I think by default, I don't know why it puts a default country. And that would update the map for that entry. So yeah, they're now in Brighton. Um, another feature we have that's quite common is a newsroom. So this can vary if uh, council is more active in trying to promote themselves, or it can be straightforward as press releases. It started life as the Brighton Hove newsroom and then was developed further by London councils. 
um, for their press release department. And so that offers uh, news editors who are typically a separate team, just an easy way for them to add um, new stories. It also has the ability um, to have a separate newsroom if you wanted multiple newsrooms. And you can just, yeah, this is just an example of adding the, I can also click that thing just to make it a bit larger um, to edit that story. And you can also select to promote that on the newsroom, which would make it an article that goes in to the header. So it gets featured at the top and you can have a set of articles at the top as well, if that's a new story that you wanted people to particularly focus on. And the other feature is this thing called subsites. Subsites are when you want more rich content on your site, so not just the static uh, services page, so they typically will live in their own section. Um, and what's interesting about them is, if I add one, is they use the paragraphs module and they use, uh, they use a thing called a page builder, which is um, actually a module called layout paragraphs. And you can drop content in, I can put a text box. Or I could have an image, and media. Uh, I can save that. And then, oh, yes, I need to make it apparent. So I will put it in save. <clears throat> and this is the moderated content. So if you have content that is reviewed by a service team, that could then be published. And then that exists into that document. Um, cool. The other one I want to show you before we hit the wrap up is, so a new, uh, well, it's been around in Drupal for a long time, which is web forms. And that's something that we're trying to promote more because um, rather than use a proprietary solution, this is something where you can give people the opportunity, the content editors, the opportunity to build forms themselves. So let's have a simple form um, of you want to report something. So a typical transaction might be reporting a lost dog. Um, that's built um, in a UI. So you can assemble the pages together. Um, I might add an element which is date. It's <coughs> because I didn't enable it. Uh, extend. Oh, oh, oh. Would be a demo without something going a bit wrong. Um, Forms date. Install. Uh, okay, so if I went into my form, uh, what's a lost dog? Build. on the bit where I say last scene, add element, uh, date, uh, when did you last uh, save? And I can save those elements and what I also want to do in my settings, I'm just gonna to go to the handlers. So you could set up an email and have the form email you, but you also have the option of most councils will have a CRM. So you might wanna just post, um, I think I have to reset it because the bins only last for half an hour. Um, but if I take that value, copy that, uh, 
I am almost done. Paste that and save it. And then if I fill this form out, I can say Max Border Collie Black and White. Next, Lowest dog I've seen in tenth of the O one. Uh, so this three space date, that's actually a GDS pattern for selecting date fields. So they recommend not using pop-up calendars and to split it with a day, month, year field. Uh, if I submit that, what should happen is if I go into this, that's now posted it. So if this was a CRM system, that would then start being posted and you could um, take that form data and start um, processing that as a case. So you can use Drupal as the front end to gather information, transactions with citizens, and they benefit from the front end work you're doing with Drupal, but then you can process that in the CRM application that you're of your choice. Um, I'm going to quickly go through and just wrap up because I am conscious of time. Um, so I'll skip through some of those things we talked about. Uh, install profiles is kind of just how um, all this comes together with a distribution. So again, they're of type Drupal profile and they live under profiles contrib or again, um, sometimes it's quite useful and it's something we use at Brighton where we actually have a custom profile that, um, is a child of the main local gov Drupal profile. Um, so that can install some of our own custom modules. Um, and the info.yaml, that just says which modules you want to install. There are two sections to it. One is dependencies that you have to install. And the other is a section which is install, which get enabled by default, but you can remove them. So I might want to have a project that does install um, some of the services modules, but actually I want the option to disable them because this is just going to be a directory site. Um, and it will often contain composer.json. So that can contain, um, even though they're in the require section, it's often used by distributions to have modules that they want to show, they, that they want to be available but not actually enabled by default. So these could be some niceties like autosave, which um, is a little bit of an experimental module at the moment. Um, and profiles, the big common thing with profiles is that you will have um, config to install. So these are a set of YAML files, which is how when you install local gov Drupal for the first time, um, it sets up the relevant content types and the relevant blocks and puts those positions in place. And it can also configure some things like the date module. So we uh, changed the date to use UK formatting and not American formatting. Um, and it's used to essentially configure Drupal as, um, as you want it. So this goes back to the thing about being a tool to build CMSs. Um, it's one where you kind of shape Drupal in how you want it to be um, for your end customer. Um, and that's just, again, talking about profile modules and themes. We don't have that many with local gov Drupal, but some projects like Open Social will ship a lot of their, their own custom ones in a module directory in the profile. Um, the thing to just to note about that is that those modules, you can only use them when you're using that install profile. So if you're not using that install profile, then those modules are not available to you. Um, and yeah, just a word on independent projects. So um, with uh, some modules, you will have them independently. Um, for local gov Drupal, we list our modules on GitHub. Um, although we are thinking about moving this to drupal.org for visibility. So all of our modules, you can actually install independently. So if you wanted those alert banners 
for example, you can install it through uh, local gov Drupal alert banner through Composer, and that would just install into um, any Drupal site. It doesn't have any other dependencies. Some of the other modules do have dependencies on other Drupal sites, so um, other of the local gov modules, so it will bring a lot more down. Um, I think that should wrap up. Yeah, so uh, that's just some information on what Drupal and distributions. Um, for more information from Drupal.org, the three links there, they're for local gov Drupal. So local gov Drupal.org has more general information. There's also a doc site for um, getting more specific of getting started. Um, we're currently on GitHub as local gov Drupal, and it's also Drupal.org slash project slash local gov is the Drupal.org page. Um, they're on most of the socials as at local gov Drupal. So if you want to talk to those, um, you can find out more information on them. Um, and that's a couple of links on the usage history the, and the statistics that I found, um, particularly the, the digital health check, which is from somebody who was previously associated with the project. And they do a, a scan of the CMS landscape used by local government. That's uh, been quite interesting to see it grow. Um, yeah, that's kind of wrapping up. I'm sorry, it took a bit longer than I anticipated, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. One, two. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. That was super interesting. Yeah. Um, I really like that it can be like very user friendly and like yeah, no code or very low code. But also, you seem to be able to push it quite quite a lot as well mm -hmm. and do stuff the Symfony way, the Symfony mm -hmm. way as well, which I'm sure Symfony developers uh, enjoy. Um, with regard to Composer dependencies. So you can install, install a bunch of stuff with Composer, mm -hmm. obviously. So you said like the modules and the themes and stuff like that. Yeah. But can you also theoretically use pretty much any PHP package? Is it compatible as well? Or? Yeah. So you can, if you can install it with Composer, it will install. Um, in order to use it, you typically will need to have some bridging functionality. So you'll need to create a module that provides a service. So just defining it in a services.yaml. Right. Um, and then that class is available. So the typical pattern in Drupal is, is that you inject things into a services container, and then you can use that in any of your custom yeah. classes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Does anybody have a question? Hey. <laughs> what, what's the performance like? I mean, I've, I haven't used Drupal <laughs> since. Drupal six or something, but what what's the performance like and scalability like? Because obviously you're going on councils, I imagine they can get quite fair, well fairly heavy traffic. So how does Drupal perform with that, or do you have to actually add some additional layers into the system for that? Uh, yeah, so um, Drupal seven world um, where the performance was quite an issue was um, because it was quite heavyweight and all the code was having to be loaded in each request. Now that it's running through Symfony, um, only the relevant parts are actually loaded. So it is quite fast in that respect. Um, there are lots of caching that comes in built in. So by default, all anonymous users get a static HTML of each page once it's generated. So once each page is in the cache, um, it's, it's fairly instant in terms of performance. It can still be quite heavyweight for logged in users. So there is quite a lot of caching involved and the caching got greatly improved with Drupal 8. So you assign cache tags to each of those build arrays. So each actually, it's not just each page, but each section of a page can have its own separate cache and its own context around that. Um, so yeah, in performance is quite well. Um, again, it, it comes down to how the site's built and the kind of code that you're running. Um, we typically use New Relic to help diagnose performance issues. Um, so I think major pain points for us have been things like some of the web forms um, for the editors can be a bit slow. Um, however, generally these days it's actually quite performant um, up there with a lot of main web applications. 
example. On that note, actually, do you know if Drupal can be used to generate uh, static websites? Yes. So it, there is a built-in REST API, so you can turn any piece of content into a JSON endpoint. And there is a contrib module that also lets you set up um, REST APIs. So typically, and I think uh, it might be Greenwich, one of the council is intending to use it headless. Mm. So they intend to have a React front end, um, but then just call into Drupal. So the editors would use Drupal, but um, on the front end it would be React. There's also a static site generator for Drupal called Tome, and that can plug into um, either export it as files or um, export it into a Git repository or even the Netlify API. And so you can use that, again, have a site that you just maintain for authoring, and then you just publish the pages. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I when I think at most websites, I would think that users are distributed globally. Well, in this case, it's exactly the opposite, right? And so a CDN wouldn't be, would be leveraged probably in a different way or not quite leveraged. There, is there any reasoning around that in terms of modules or architectures? Um, I mean, there is the standard set of, um, there's the purge module that helps you with caching and the varnish cache, um, depending on your host. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the built-in functionality, it's not really assuming much in terms of geography. Um, it'll depend on where you're hosted. I mean, I can say that in Brighton, we do have a, because of a lot of student population and overseas, so we do get lots of legitimate traffic from places like Hong Kong and across Europe and America, not just in the UK. And so it wouldn't be saved on the CDN. They wouldn't, the time to live would be the second request wouldn't mm. meet the time to leave thresholds. You wouldn't have mm. two users connecting from Hong Kong roughly at the same time. No, so I mean, it wouldn't leverage on a CDN outside Brighton. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, it can vary a lot on your host and the hosting infrastructure. So it's not necessarily something Drupal itself. Mm. I, I was thinking helps. whether there is something that, whether you have done any reasoning around it. Uh, yeah, it's not something that's come up with us. Um, it's something that would be of interest, and it's something we can certainly talk through on the local Gov Drupal groups. Because, um, yeah, again, it would be quite interesting to see the distribution. Um, in terms of built-in functionality, that the, there is the caching and there is the uh, dynamic page cache and the static caching, which, um, again, that's done on a global level. So all users, if they're anonymous users, not logged in, they are largely getting but a... It's caching on the data center level, yeah. not on the edge. Not on the edge. So, I mean, again, depends on your hosting. So the hosting we have, that that is going through a CDN, um, and that would largely be either the... Uh, I'm trying to remember where their data centers are, but it would largely be on their UK data center that it would be taking it from. Okay. Thank you. Do you guys meet up actually with the, all of the contributors now that there are like uh, so many councils using yeah, it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so in terms of the development and that, there are regular online meetups. So we do kind of a merge. It was Merge Monday. It's now Merge Tuesdays, where we will, um, for whoever's about, will come in and start looking at pull requests on a call. Mm -hmm. And there are various other community meetups. So as I said, it's not just devs, it's the non-technical users will also, uh, or the product owners and um, content designers will can also have their own meetups for discussing um, and exchanging ideas of the kind of things they're wanting to get out of it. Um, but we did have a few in-person ones. So just before Christmas, we did have a social, um, so a little gathering up in London Bridge. Um, so that was good to meet some of the councils that were also involved and the new ones that have come in. And we did a, a mini online conference back in November. So there was a local Gov Drupal week. Um, so there's a presentation there with me um, talking about upgrading from nine to 10. 
and right. various others, like there was one talking about accessibility. Um, so again, that's a big push that we have to do in public sector because we all have to be um, to the WCAG 2.1, and I think it's just gone to 2.2 .2 AA right. compliant. Um, and that's again, something that the local gov base theme gives you. It gives you that kind of compliance out the box. Um, but yeah, that was kind of an interesting meet and discussions with all the people involved. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Like it seems to be growing into a proper community. So <laughs> yeah, I would, have, I would have expected that actually. Any other questions? Do you have any questions online maybe? No, we don't. No, that's it. All right. Well, let's okay. get another round of uh, applause for Andy. Okay. I've got a few things to tell you before we wrap up. Um, uh, oh, yes, yeah, so we've got our next meetup. Uh, so the page is up. We don't have the details yet. It's going to be in March, and it's going to be about WordPress, this one. Uh, so, yeah, you can already sign up if you want to. Just flash the QR code. And we also have a few upcoming events in the Silicon Rights Network. Uh, so async is uh, tomorrow apparently uh, it's here i think as well yeah um so i don't know what this one is about uh, it's usually around javascript and stuff like that uh brighton kotlin so sex game makers is that new And that's going to be at projects. Oh, very nice. Okay, that uh, sounds good. And uh, yeah, AWS Brighton user group. Um, so you can find all of the details of all of that stuff if you scan the QR code over there. Uh, other a lot of other events as well. Um, yes, you can join the Slack community. Uh, so it's a Silicon Brighton um, managed uh, Slack workspace, but there's also a PHP Sussex channel in it. So you're um, more than welcome to join and. Uh, Keep the conversation going and also as i remember um i got contacted by php uk today uh so i don't know if you know about php uk it's uh, a big php conference happening every year in london so it's next month uh, and they told me that they are happy to offer 10 percent off uh, to the members of the php sussex community so if you're interested in going just let me know yeah. and uh yeah we can get that arranged and i think that's it yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I think you can. I think we have a few more minutes. We can hang hang around and uh, have another drink. And yeah. Okay. So you're welcome to stay for a bit longer if you want to. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah. Thank you for coming. And thanks again to Silicon Brighton and Runway East. And uh, yeah. See you next time.